for a couple minutes and let people start to trickle in. Actually, all right. But um, essentially, what we're going to be doing today is a live Q and A covering um, everything to do with hoof abscesses, since it's the muddy season here in Kentucky, and we're busy seeing a lot of hoof abscess calls. Um, we hope to make this a series, so please, if you have any ideas for future topics to cover, feel free to recommend them. Even if you can't stay for the entire live stream, you're welcome to leave your questions and they might be answered later or we can always use them at another time. So even if you can't stay the whole time, please, we encourage you to participate still. Um, and like we said, we'll probably start in about um, a minute or so just to let um, the last couple of people come in. People can come on and trickle in. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Move up here. It looks like we've already got some questions that have come in too, which is really exciting. So remember, if you want to know anything, please don't hesitate to, you know, send in your questions, ask us, I'd love to answer them. We're talking about hoof abscesses this evening. Um, but if in the future there's another thing you want us to talk about, please let us know. Um, I love talking to you all and educating everybody as much as possible. So, yeah. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Dr. Robertson. <laughs> I love it. We're starting to get our little bubble comments in. Perfect. Yeah. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let's see. One, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay. So yeah, we'll definitely. We'll let them come in. Let's see. Oh, we got another question coming in. Oh, perfect. Okay, so to start, mm -hmm. what causes hoof abscesses? Like, what are they, and how do we? Well, uh, yeah. If any of you all are horse owners, you are familiar with hoof abscesses. It's just um, a nature of the beast. It's something that we deal with all the time. And it's actually one of the most common causes of lameness in horses today. Um, so typically hoof abscesses are caused by muddy weather um, or not muddy weather, rainy weather causing mud, which can cause our horse's feet and hooves to soften, especially in the sole. Um, what happens when your horse's feet get soft is there can be breaks, there can be cracks in them, which allow a little microscopic bacteria to get up in that foot um, and become trapped and form an abscess and grow and propagate in there and cause problems. Um, now, there's a few other things that can cause hoof abscesses. They can start out as uh, sole bruises, um, which are pretty difficult to deal with because usually those are more deep seated. Um, and, you know, just anything um, with inflammation or um, even a penetrating wound, if your horse stepped on a nail um, or some sort of foreign body that has gotten into your horse's foot and, and formed a pocket of infection, um, that's typically where we see our abscesses. So, yeah. Um, Perfect. So how do we spot them? What is this going to look like to a horse owner? To the layman out there, your hoof abscesses typically start out more mild, but they can come on suddenly. Um, they can start out, you know, almost completely non-weight bearing lame, but it's typically just on one foot. Um, there are two things that will cause a horse to hold his foot out and say, oh God, it hurts. Um, and it's either a broken bone or a hoof abscess, which are the complete opposite ends of the spectrum, which can make them kind of scary. Um, but typically they start out a little less lame and progress as it worsens in the area. Um, you Typically you will feel raging digital pulses on your affected limb and only your affected limb. You're not gonna have them all around. Like uh, when you have a laminitic horse, you're going to have increased digital pulses, you know, especially in the front feet. Um, you know, there can be heat in the foot or you can even see an area around the coronary band where the gravel is starting to come out. So, you know, those are just some things to look for, um, especially with hoof abscesses. And if they've already burst, you can actually find the draining track mm -hmm. either on the coronet band or on the foot itself. So, um, yeah, those are some things to look for. I guess we'll go ahead and say hello to everybody. Hi. 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 Welcome. <laughs> We're so glad you all are here. We're glad you can uh, join us and if you all have any questions, please feel free to join the chat, send us questions. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to answer them all. So, Perfect. Um, okay. So when do we call a vet? Okay. So most hoof abscesses take anywhere between three to seven days to break. If you're pretty sure that's what you're dealing with and you want to start um, soaking them yourself and packing them yourself, 
you know, if you're experienced with these things, um, you know, you can start, but if your hoof abscess has not burst within three to seven days, it's time to start calling a vet. Also, if your horse is completely non-weight bearing lame, it's not a bad idea to have us out there to x-ray it, to make sure that there's no break going on, there's no bone affected, you know. Um, we don't want this to turn into something more significant than just a hoof abscess. Um, you know, and really, we don't ever want you to hesitate to call us, even if it's just the first day and they're still lame. You know, if, if you have questions or need your horse looked at, please call us and let us help you through this. But, um, you know, if it's been going on for a little while, your horse may just have tough hoof walls or there could be more going on. And we definitely need to come out and make sure that there's nothing worse happening. Perfect. All right. Hi, Allison. Hi, Allison. <laughs> All right, perfect. So how do we prevent this? Uh, preventing, or preventing hoof abscesses is one of the uh, great mysteries in life. Um, <laughs> really keeping your horse's feet as dry, um, you know, and as clean as possible, picking them out regularly um, and not allowing them to stand all day in standing water or in a muddy field, that's going to be your best preventative per se. Um, you know, also making sure that you pick up small stones and rocks in your field, that's going to be really helpful with helping to prevent the hoof abscess. Um, and, you know, just good hoof maintenance, making sure your horse has a good, strong, well cared for foot with little cracks or breaks. Routine farrier work is extremely important to hoof health. Um, so, you know, those are your big things, but making sure that they don't have soft, susceptible to cracking feet. Mm -hmm. That's going to be your big preventative. So, um, perfect. Mm -hmm. Are there any breeds of horses or obviously areas of the country mm -hmm. that you see this? Yeah. Morning? Yeah. You know, um, thin sold horses might be more susceptible. It's not necessarily breeds that we're talking mm -hmm. about here, but it's more or less, um, you know, the or every horse is different. They all have different quality of foot and different thicknesses of hoof wall. Um, and you have to know your own horse um, when you're dealing with these things. Um, but typically you're more thin sold breeds um, and ones that are located in wet, swampy areas are going to be a little more susceptible to this. Okay, perfect. Do you see any difference in shoes versus no shoes? Uh, that also plays into our um, great equalizer with the horses that they're all different and they're all susceptible to different Perfect. things. Yeah, um, you know, if you have a really sturdy, solid footed horse um, that you keep barefoot, they may never get an abscess, you know, um, and you may have your horse in top of the line, you know, shoes and have the farrier come out every four weeks and you may get abscesses all the time. Um, it's just different individuals and you have to listen to your horse and let them tell you what kind of individual they are. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some good solution options when we go to soak the hoof itself? Oh, well, um, you know, when you're soaking your hoof um, and you suspect a foot abscess, really the, the best thing to soak their feet in is going to be magnesium sulfate, which is just over the counter Epsom salts. Um, and then I, I always call it betadine, which is the veterinary version of it, but uh, povidone iodine um, to dilute into your uh, solution is going to be the best thing to kill out off any of that bacteria that is causing those foot abscesses. So um, yeah, that, that's my preferred solution. There are a few other things you can do, clean tracks, um, you know, I, I Think you can't beat an Epsom salt and betadine soap because it's inexpensive and man, it works. <laughs> so if someone has a horse and the lameness has just come on, mm -hmm. how often would they soak at home mm -hmm. in the start of this treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we're soaking these guys, um, I like to generally recommend twice daily for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you know, once in the morning and once in the evening. Um, just so you're really getting in there and getting that antibacterial um, and the drawing proponents of the um, Epsom salts. So, you know, that's typically going to do well. If you have something like a poultice, like an animal lintex that you can keep them wrapped in, which is also acts as a drawing salve, um, you know, that's great too. But, you know, 
standing your horse in a bucket twice a day for 15 to 20 minutes in that solution can be really effective at drawing these things out. So perfect. Yeah. And then just so you all are aware, after you soak, we do have a video up where Dr. Robertson goes over how to wrap the foot once you've soaked it, which is a really great reference tool for the second portion of that. Exactly. So as far as um, soaks and whatnot go, is there a difference between a holistic or an over-the-counter mm -hmm. or? Well, you know, as far as holistic soaks or anything like that go, um, you know, you can't get much more holistic than just Epsom salts, basically. Um, the betadine might be, uh, you know, considered something that's less holistic. Um, but, you know, over the counter stuff that you can deal, obviously, you can get the betadine and the uh, Epsom salts at your local Walgreens. Um, but other things that you can use to treat feet that you can get over the counter. Um, I've seen dilute bleach used to clean thrush out. It's pretty good with that. Um, and then also I've, I've used Listerine to uh, kill thrush on my own horses when I was younger. So, um, you know, there's a few different things that you can use to kill off that bacteria, which causes some of our problems. So, yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So getting away from hoof abscesses and going more into the thrush spectrum of mm -hmm. things, how do you spot thrush? Oh, thrush, <laughs> thrush. Um, so you're gonna know your horse has thrush when you go to pick their feet out and you have a white, powdery, awful, foul smelling substance in uh, the grooves along their sulcus or along the, the frog. Um, thrush has a very uh, distinct scent to it. Um, it smells kind of like rotten eggs. Um, in my personal opinion, yes. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so, you know, and thrush infections are actually really common in horses. I see it all the time, especially here in Kentucky, where we do have this unpredictable weather where there's moisture, you know, it happens. Not everybody can pick out their horse's feet twice a day. Um, but I do like to recommend that every horse have their feet picked out at least once a day or as frequently as they can, no less than that, if possible. <laughs> um, and that's gonna be one of your best ways to prevent this nasty fungus from getting into your horse's feet, so. Well, I imagine it's a great way just to keep an eye on their foot health in exactly, general. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. If you're laying eyes on your horse's feet once a day, um, picking them out, you know, and examining them, even if it's just for a second, you're going to know when you have cracks, when you've got softening, um, it's really gonna help you stay on top of things a little better. Um, and generally, also, it's a good bonding experience for you and your horse. You just go out and pick your feet out once a day. They're going to love you a little more that way. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Leslie asked, does it matter warm water or cool when you go to soak? I like to use warm water. I think it dissolves the Epsom salts a little better and it kind of draws that abscess out a little better. Um, you know, uh, there's some school of thought that potentially cold water could reduce inflammation, but I would much rather have it sucked out than, you know, act as, we're using other stuff to reduce inflammation. If that makes any sense, I apologize. Um, but I think the warm water works better. I've always used warm water for hoof soaks with my Epsom salts and um, betadine, so. Perfect. Great, great question. And then Adam asked about the shod hoof versus the non. So just double check, um, mm -hmm. watch through the video recording afterwards. We're going to post it. So anything we've already covered, you can catch up on. Yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. And then let's see, Dan uh, Danielle asked, do you recommend patching or packing those central sulcus cracks? Um, packing it. I mean, not not particularly because the the way the frog actually works, it's a suspensory apparatus that keeps that bone um, cushion. So your your central sulci, your sulci are actually really important. Um, but you know, maintaining a, a good trimmed, a properly trimmed foot is very important to the health of that. Um, and you know, if we're not getting regular trims. There are lots of nooks and crannies where you can get thrush in that foot, but packing it actually full of a material can be detrimental to your horse's health. Um, just by preventing a little bit of that cushion and that give that mm -hmm. that hoof that um, that frog apparatus is meant for. So, Perfect. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then um, someone from Instagram actually asked, is it okay to work a horse that's having um, 
a current flare-up with thrush. Okay, yeah, and then that's a great question too. I get asked that a lot. Um, so thrush, as long as we're not seeing an effect to the lame or an actual lameness going on and it hasn't gotten deeper, gotten into the foot or anything like that, as long as you're treating them for it, I do not have a problem with working and riding a horse that has thrush, okay? You just need to be taking care of it. Pick their feet out, make sure they stay dry. Um, you know, get some thrush buster. You can get it pretty much anywhere um, that you can get other supplies for your horse. It's that purple stuff that you put in the middle. It's great for killing thrush. Um, I also said Listerine earlier, dilute bleach solution. Um, you know, anything to treat it and try and get it killed off. As long as you don't have any actual disruption in the sole of the foot, it's perfectly fine. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So let's get into MagnaWave. Okay, yeah, so, which is right behind us right now. Yes, yeah. yes. So what is MagnaWave, first of all? Okay, so the MagnaWave that we have and that we've been utilizing is a pulsed mm -hmm. electromagnetic field. It's a PEMF. Um, and it's this nifty little box that Candace is rolling up for us right here um, that come with attachments. Um, and what MagnaWave does essentially is it sends an electromagnetic field through the actual area of focus um, and stimulates the cells. So it stimulates blood flow, it stimulates oxygenation, um, it stimulates calcium influx by sending that pulsed electromagnetic field through it. Um, and we can actually use this technology to treat hoof abscesses, which is something um, we weren't previously able, able to do until this technology came along. You used to either have to dig them out and cause a huge hole in the bottom of your horse's foot, or if it's gonna bust out through the coronary band, you have to wait. Um, and it's a long and painful wait with those guys. However, with this guy, we can um, essentially suck the abscess out. Um, it draws the infection and inflammation to the area of least resistance. Um, and I've seen abscesses burst in one go with this guy. Sometimes it can take multiple treatments with it, you know, two to three. Um, however, for your really tough, really deep seated abscesses, um, we do really like to use the MagnaWave. It's, it's a good piece of technology. I'm gonna grab the box as well. Yeah. So everyone can kind of see how this would work. Yeah. Um, so what we do is we actually stand the horse on the box um, and our little zoom attachment goes inside of it um, and their foot is directly on it. There's just a thick leather, leather padding between the zoom and their foot um, and it sends a powerful pulse up in through this. I've actually felt the magna wave turned all the way up to suck on the abscess on myself and it might've made me jump a little bit. Um, but it, what it does, it doesn't cause them pain. It sucks it right out. It's really cool. Perfect. Yeah. And then let's see. All right. And then someone had also asked earlier on Facebook. So we know this is great technology for mm -hmm. hoof abscess, but for our small animal clients, do we have any applications for MagnaWave on that side? Oh, absolutely. Um, the cool thing about MagnaWave, uh, its initial uh, purpose was to use for muscle soreness, you know, injury recovery, um, you know, those, those kinds of things. So especially like in our chiropractic cases or cases with chronic muscular pain, arthritis, um, hip dysplasia, um, you know, anything like that where they're carrying a lot of tension or pain, especially in their muscles or along their apaxials in their back, um, the MagnaWave is a great tool for that. Um, it, it loosens them up. It's like a massage on steroids that actually causes healing um, is the best way yeah. to describe it. And I, we don't actually have to give them steroids. So that's another wonderful part about it is, you know, we can back off a little bit on the pharmaceutical component of things and do more of a therapeutic modality. So, Perfect. yeah. And then, so Susan asked if we could talk a little bit about white line disease. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so white line disease and hoof abscesses do talk hand in hand, uh, or, or do they walk hand in hand, they don't talk. Um, but so the white line on a horse's foot, I'm trying to think, I don't know that I have a good, um, 
actual model for you right now. Um, but the white line is the separation between the actual sole itself and where the hoof wall meets, okay? Um, and we've got lamina that go in, uh, to there and they weave themselves together like that. They're like little fingers. Um, and you know, when a horse gets laminitis, those lamina come apart. But what happens if the hoof sole has, is poor quality and the bottom breaks apart? We get infection um, and bacteria up into that white line um, and it causes separation of the hoof wall. Um, and, and the longer it's allowed to continue, the worse it gets. So, um, oh good, Candace has a picture for us of our frog um, and our foot, uh, maybe not. Um, but so what happens with like white line diseases, we're dealing with bacteria and infection getting into that white line and causing separation. Um, you know, so trimming their feet, keeping that white line clean, um, using something we use, uh, I just completely blanked on what I was gonna say. <laughs> um, keeping it clean, keeping it, um, you know, wrapped and well trimmed is really hugely important for white line disease. Um, you know, and it can affect horses who are even trimmed frequently, but if there's any sort of disruption in that white line, um, at any point in their life, they can become more susceptible to it. So, yeah. um, I don't know if we have any more specific questions about it. About um, white line, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, if anyone has any questions, remember this is an open session. So yeah. We're going to send them our way. Um, but... Leslie also asked, can you tell the difference between, how do you tell the difference between an abscess and a stone bruise? Oh, okay. Um, your stone bruises are typically going to go away faster um, and, you know, easier. A stone bruise uh, is, is, has not become a big juicy abscess yet. Um, so, you know, with butte therapy and with soaking therapy, if we have improved over the course of three to seven days, and even if we haven't had anything rupture out, that's typically when you can just go with, oh, he's got a bruise on a stone bruise on the bottom of his foot. If after those, you know, three to seven days of soaking, view therapy, um, you know, taking, doing everything you can to throw at it at these guys, if it still hasn't ruptured, you're probably dealing with an abscess and a deep one at that. Okay. Um, your stone bruises are going to heal quicker and you're going to have a much lesser degree of lameness than you are with an abscess. Perfect. So. And we've had a couple variations of this question, mm -hmm. but essentially um, a horse is lame, comes out, farrier can't find an abscess for sure. Mm -hmm. What are some other steps we can take to look at that foot and mm -hmm. tell what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. I, the first and foremost thing I would recommend is taking x-rays of that foot. Um, you know, if you've been hunting for an abscess, we're still lame, we're still having problems. Um, the fastest and most um, informative thing that you can do to tell us what this problem is, is taking radiographs of the affected foot and of the unaffected feet so we can compare them. Um, there are other things that can go wrong with a hoof abscess. It can continue going deeper and it can affect the bone and become an osteomyelitis, um, which is a train wreck. So we don't want things to continue to progress. So actually taking images of the affected foot is, is hugely important, especially if they're not improving. Um, and, you know, is, if, which is one of the reasons why I said um, when we first started this stream if they are non-weight bearing call us out please um you know we don't want to run the risk of there being something more insidious than a foot bruise going on or a subsolar abscess um i think it's very important that we protect your horse from that too so yeah yeah, yeah. if in doubt call yeah if, if you <laughs> are ever in doubt please call us we are never going to say ah no we can't talk to you right now uh that's that's not the way we work <laughs> And then a uh, great question, uh, Terry asked, can MagnaWave be used to help heal bone? Oh yeah, actually it can. Um, that, we don't recommend using it on completely like fresh fractures, um, but there has been some evidence that uh, MagnaWave can expedite bone healing. So, yeah. And then we also have shockwave therapy. Yes, we also have shockwave therapy, which is uh, probably the more recommended of the two therapies that there's actually a lot more literature um, and, and scientific ex evidence um, for the shockwave therapy, but the MagnaWave isn't going to hurt. It's not going to cause, um, 
you know, issues. So yeah, yeah, great question. Thank you. And then when to use Butte. Okay, very good. Um, Butte, I like butting horses that have abscesses that are close to rupturing because they actually promote movement, okay? Um, if your horse is walking around a little bit more on that foot abscess, it's going to squish out faster if they're bearing full weight on it. If they're gimping around, not putting any weight on it, um, you know, it's not going to rupture as quickly because they're not putting any pressure on it. And um, a horse bearing weight on their foot increases circulation. It causes the blood flow to go um, to work better. Um, and that's really going to help suck that abscess out or squish it out um, if they're walking around on it. So, you know, it, as long as your horse isn't non-weight bearing lame um, and you're suspecting an abscess, uh, I, I think for the first, you know, three to five days, you're safe to, to administer some butte to encourage them to walk and to encourage that abscess to rupture. Perfect. And then just for anybody coming to catch up, because um, it looks like we've had a, a couple other comments about it too. Yeah. What, again, when should we call a vet and okay. when should it? Yes. Okay. Um, so calling a vet, if your horse is non-weight bearing, if they are not putting any weight on a particular limb, call us, please. There are typically two things that result in a horse being non-weight bearing, and it's either a hoof abscess or a broken bone. Um, and the latter of those, we don't we don't recommend messing around with. We recommend giving us a call just so we can come out and confirm, um, not to freak anybody out or anything, because it is far more common for it to be a hoof abscess, far more common. <laughs> um, but, you know, non-weight bearing is typically a, a, a time you want us to come out there. Um, second of all, um, some horses have big, solid, strong feet. You've been working on giving them the nicest, strongest feet ever, and that abscess just doesn't want to come out. If it hasn't ruptured, in three to seven days after you've initiated treatment and soaking with Epsom salts and betadine um, and wrapping even poulticine with animal intex, you know, if it hasn't ruptured in that time, you need to give us a call and the horse is still lame. Um, you know, that way we can take x-rays, see where the actual hoof abscess itself is, um, make sure that there's no bone affected. Um, you know, that's going to be when you want to call us out. Um, and third time, I don't know that I mentioned it earlier as, as I should have. Um, if you see a nail sticking out of your horse's foot or some sort of foreign by body, some sort of foreign object, a wire, a nail, I've seen it all. I've seen barbed wire. Um, call us immediately, please, because we need to make sure that the bone's not affected. We need to see how far in the track goes. You know, it can be a life-threatening injury for them to have stepped on a nail and we can readily evaluate it and make sure and potentially save the horse's life so so if they do step on a foreign mm -hmm. object before the owner calls mm -hmm. should they pull it or should they leave it in absolutely not leave that bad boy in so we can see where it goes um i know it seems counterintuitive but that way we can see how far it has penetrated into the actual hoof itself and see if how close it is to the bone, how close it is to the joint. There's a navicular bursa in there, which we really need to avoid um, and really just leave it in place, leave it be. Call us, there's someone here available 24 <laughs> seven. We will get out there and take x-rays as soon as we can, so. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point because mm -hmm. I feel like that's one of those emergencies that um, it's almost kind of secret, you know, no one really knows what to do mm -hmm, in that instance. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. Yeah. And then um, we'll let a couple more questions come in, but mm -hmm. we're at our point where we're wrapping up. Yeah. Um, but do you want to just say a couple of things about who we are and yeah. whatnot for anybody who might not know us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so this is Candace. Candace Hi. is um, has been here at Bannon Woods Veterinary Hospital for, for a while. She's one of our tried and true um, technicians. Um, and my name is Erin Crampy Kaiser. I have been a veterinarian here at Bannon Woods Veterinary Hospital for almost a year and a half now. Um, and I originally, before this, I worked at the racetrack. I've worked mixed animal practice down in Tennessee. I'm a graduate of Auburn University. Um, and I love Bannon Woods. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a 
wonderful place to practice. We are a 24, well, we're uh, an equine emergency and referral clinic um, who also happens to see small animals. Um, we are, consider ourselves a referral hospital. Um, we have equine surgical capabilities here um, and we have a lot of technology that we'd like to integrate into our treatment and into our medicine. Um, so we can provide the best possible care for you, your horses and your pets. So, um, yeah. Yeah, because we'll small ruminants, mm -hmm. exotics, mm -hmm. all included. And as we mentioned earlier, this is something we are potentially looking to turn into a series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyone watching, if there's a topic that you would like covered, um, whether it be for cats or dogs, exotics, any, or pretty much anything. Topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk to you on all the stuff that I uh, I know about. <laughs> if we have to bring in another vet, we totally can. Yeah, <laughs> we have a few here. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and then um, for everybody still watching or who's gonna tune in later, mm -hmm. keep an eye on our page. We're going to have a lot of really cool announcements coming up within the next month, so keep an eye out. Lots of excitement, yes. so yeah. We can't wait to share with you. It's almost hard keeping a secret. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But again, those questions, you can send them to us in our inbox. You can leave them in this comment mm. or just mention them when you see your doctor in your Yeah. Yeah. We're Never hesitate to call me. I don't mind talking to you. <laughs> yes. We're always available for reference. Mm -hmm. And then let's see. Yes. Uh, Dawn, speaking of exotics, she asked if we can see sulcata tortoises. So we can. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, oh, thank you, Susan. She said, love you guys so much. You've been so wonderful with my horses and my cat. Susan, we're so glad we could help you out. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank you for everyone who came out to our first live Q&A session. Yeah, yeah, this has been great. Um, I love being able to talk with you all and interact with you all. Um, please don't ever hesitate to ask me any questions if you have them. Um, you know, call us if you ever need anything. That's what we're here for. We wanna help you and we wanna help your animals. Um, and we're so happy that we can educate you um, and answer any questions you have. So uh, send us more questions, send us more topics that you want us to do talks on. You know, this has just been a blast. Um, and we wanna thank all of you all for tuning in tonight. So yes, yeah. very appreciate it. All right. Thank well, you, bye everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> have a good night. Have a Merry Christmas. Yes. Yay. Yes. <laughs>